All right, tonight's reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 7, um, verses 6 through 9. And this is, this is to God's people Israel. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers sure that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments to a thousand generations. Do you remember the little um, guess how many fill in the blank are in the jar games? My elementary librarian used to do them all the time. I swear all the time. So she would put out a little jar of like jelly beans or candy corn or M&Ms and you'd have to guess how many were inside the jar and the person who got closest to the correct number would win a prize. I never won and I might be more bitter about it if I was ever actually close but to this day I can't guesstimate anything to save my life. The price is right. I could never, I could never do it. So I want to try to play a little guess how many game with you right now. In this book that I'm holding, how many promises are written about? For reference, there's like a thousand and some pages, and it's also the Bible. Think of a guess, think of a guess. All of them. Mm, that's so close to what I wrote, because my grand total is a lot. <laughs> a lot of people have attempted to total up all the promises in scripture, but it's nearly impossible to do. There's no explicit word that means promise in the Old Testament Hebrew, but God certainly does make many. From the covenants to the prophets, God tells of and guarantees things to come. One Bible enthusiast on his 27th read of scripture determined the grand total to be around 7,500 promises made by God. Of course, it's nearly impossible to know how many promises are truly made in Scripture. Uh, 7,500 still seems like a really solid number. And the most incredible thing about 7,500 or more promises made by God is that there's not one that God did not follow through on. These promises that God makes and fulfills in Scripture, not even taking into account all the promises God has made and fulfilled throughout time, are an incredible testimony to God's faithfulness. On Sunday, I talked a little bit about how we are to go about being faithful to God, but I think sometimes our inability to do so lies in our uncertainty if God is faithful to us. So to help understand God's faithfulness, I decided to use my trusty Bible dictionary to uncover what we mean when we say God is faithful. I found that the word faithfulness is used in several contexts throughout the Old and New Testaments. Some of the scriptural synonyms that I found are trust, reliability, stability, loyalty, guarantee, security, and truth. To me, all of these words describe a solid relationship. Each of these are essential to the integrity of a relationship. In scripture, these kinds of relationships of promise and commitment are called covenants. The Old Testament's biggest covenant, in my opinion, is the Mosaic Covenant, which um, is exactly what was being outlined in these verses from Deuteronomy. God had chosen Israel to be his holy people, not because of who they were or what they had done, but because of his love and promises. The nature of this covenant was conditional. 
God would set apart Israel from other people, deliver them to the promised land, love them, and God gave them a collection of commandments that they needed to follow. Verse 9 outlines this. It says, Therefore know that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God builds relationships to love and provide for the people he created, but God did and does expect relationships to be two-sided. As we know, the Israelites did not rock at keeping all of God's commandments, so we fast forward a little bit, and that's how we end up with Jesus and the new covenant of the New Testament. It's a relationship that we are all invited into, not based on anything we do. All that is necessary is having faith in God's promise, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just like God redeemed his people Israel from the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt, God has redeemed us from sin and darkness to keep, to keep us in steadfast love and life. And that's the really brilliant thing about the gospel is that it's for all of us to be in relationship with God. So at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, do we believe God to be faithful, to be our redeemer? Is the cross enough for us to believe that God will always be faithful, that God will always be reliable, stable, loyal, true? It should be, but it feels like there are a lot of buts in our lives. But this circumstance, but this suffering. You look at the world and it's just one giant but. But our brokenness is on display, not God's unfaithfulness. God being faithful has nothing to do with whether or not God performs in the way we want him to. Our circumstances aren't indicative of God's faithfulness. We have every reason to believe intellectually that God will be faithful. So when we doubt that God will be faithful, we probably need to turn inward. If we are faithful to God, loving God and thereby loving all God's people, would the world still look this way? And that question can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. If Adam and Eve had fully loved and trusted God, the world wouldn't have looked the way it did for them once they had left. Would COVID in America look different if we loved God, trusted God's faithfulness and providence, and loved our neighbor? I'm inclined to say yes. So when we pray and beg that the virus might disappear, and it doesn't, it's not because God is not faithful. God is loving and faithful, but he also calls us to be loving and faithful. We are the hands and feet of God. God is unwavering. God is faithful. We will recognize this when we learn to trust and rely on God's faithfulness and promises, all however many thousand of them there are. I was listening to a podcast today while I was driving, and... One question that they asked really stuck out to me, and it's what I want to leave you with today. How awesome is it that the odds are stacked against us so that we can see God be God? We can see God at work. We can see God changing hearts. We can see God changing our own hearts. We can see the work God does through us. We will see God's faithfulness. And I pray that today we trust in God's promises and that we are inclined to faithfulness as well.